In his short story, The Gift of the Magi, O. Henry shares with us the lives of a young couple who, out of their love for one another, sacrificed their most prized possession to purchase each other gifts for Christmas. Although their actual gifts were given in vain, their greatest gift was their love, their sacrificial love for one another. O. Henry's theme was by no means a new one. Similar stories have been told throughout the centuries across continents and in various cultures and ethnic groups. One such story exists in Scripture, which our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to share with us today as he tells us of the water from the well of Bethlehem. It was during his 21-year pastorate at the Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles that Dr. McGee first gave this sermon. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that your love has provided a sacrifice for not only those who believe in you, but for the whole world. May the story of your sacrificial love go forth today and touch the hearts of many. In Jesus' name, amen. Water from the well at Bethlehem. And we give you, not as a text, but a springboard to get into our subject, this first statement in the 8th verse of the 23rd chapter of Second Samuel. These be the names of the mighty man whom David had. These be the names of the mighty man whom David had. There are many unsung heroes of the Bible, and among them are the mighty men of David. No volume has been written solely about them, to my knowledge. This is a glaring omission in biblical literature today, that these men have been passed over as they have and been ignored down through the centuries. Actually, there's not many sermons that have been preached about them. For years, I have intended to run a series of messages on the mighty men of David, but I do not know why, but I've never gotten around to it yet. I remember when I first came here that I gave a message on Beniah, one of the mighty men of David. He slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day, and I tried to make him an officer of the church at that time because we need men that will not just come out when it's pretty, but actually will go out and slay a lion, and that's quite an undertaking, but he did it on a snowy day. And a little drop of rain will keep us away here in Southern California. I do not know what snow would do uh, for us. And so Benaiah is one of the mighty men of David. And I, even to this day, meet some folk who always greet me with some reference to that message. Now, we are going to speak of three of the mighty men of David. And the three that we're speaking on today are not only unsung, but they are unnamed. We have no name for them. i sorry I can't give you their names, but here they are introduced to us in verse 13. Listen to this. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time under the cave of Adullam and the troop of the Philistines, pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And uh, this is the statement concerning them. Names not given, even we're given the names of the three musketeers. But we do not have the name of these three mighty men of David who did a, a tremendous and courageous thing for David at that time. Did you know that they're in the church today, a great company? of unsung and unnamed and unknown heroes. I remember that when I was still a student in seminary, in fact, I was just graduating that spring, the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia, was without a pastor, and they had called Peter Marshall. They had had a great deal of difficulty in the church. It was torn by internal strife. And they wanted to get somebody to be the interim pastor who would not hurt the church. They figured that a seminary student would be the one. And so they asked the seminary 
to recommend someone, and they sent me there to preach, and I preached in the interval until Peter Marshall came as the pastor of that church. I never shall forget that first Sunday. It was probably the most difficult message I've ever given, and it was in a most difficult situation. Uh, The congregation was sitting there on the very edge of their pews waiting for something to be said that would cause some strife or more strife and difficulty, and the steeple of that church is just ready to blow off at any moment. And I never shall forget that how discouraged I was after the morning message, and then again after the evening message. And I felt that week I toyed with the idea of telling them I wouldn't be back anymore. And so I went on, and the next Sunday morning it was the same thing. But that second Sunday night, the Spirit of God moved in, and we saw a real working of the Spirit of God. After the message, a dear little lady, a little tiny lady she was, she came up to me and in a trembling voice. She said, "Uh, young man, I saw the problem you had last Sunday morning. I have been getting up for the past 20 some odd years, uh, praying for this church and its service, but I saw that, uh, that you were in really difficulty, and so I got up this Sunday morning an hour earlier, and I prayed for you and for the service, and tonight uh, I'm certainly rejoicing in what has happened. And may I say to you tonight, or this morning, that that night, that little lady that came up to me, and I've thought of it many times since then, I don't even remember her name at all, but everybody's heard of Peter Marshall. I wonder someday if she might not be the one that will get the credit for the ministry that he had there. She will get the credit for the ministry I had there, I know, because into that coldness, This little lady came with her prayer, and she's one of those unsung, unnamed heroes of faith. May I say that in the church we have multitudes. They're sitting here this morning. Some couldn't even get here this morning because of infirmity of the flesh. But they are the ones. They never got on the front page of the bulletin. They're not listed with the staff of this church. They never get on the inside of the bulletin. Apparently, they never come out in the public at all. But they are the really the ones that are undergirding this work with prayer and with their support. May I say there's a great company of unnamed and unsung heroes of faith, and that's going to be one of the glories of that day when we stand in his presence and he brings his reward with him We are going to see countless numbers of people. We never read about them in the Bible. We never read about them at all in church history. We didn't know they were in our church. And they were the ones who were the heroes. They were the ones that were standing back fighting the battle of faith, my beloved. And so we find here these three men. They're unnamed. They're unknown. But they are the three of the mightiest men that you'll find on the page of Scripture. In our message, I want to answer two very simple questions relative to these mighty men. The first one is, who were they? And the second is, what did they do? And I want you, as best we can, to get acquainted with these mighty men of David, for they're worth knowing. I expect someday when we get to heaven, I know one thing, I want to meet every one of them. I want to sit down and talk with each one of them about his his exploits that he did for God under David. I want to talk to each one of these men who did so much in that day for the cause of God. Now, will you notice these men, who they were? There are 32 of them that are listed here in 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. If you turn to this corresponding passage over in 1 Chronicles, the 10th chapter, or rather the 11th chapter, you would find there 
that there are actually 48 listed, 16 more than are listed here. Now, neither this list nor the one in Chronicles is a complete list at all. It's as it were that God just tore a page out of his roster in heaven and put it down here in his word to let you and me know that there were men and women back in those days who lived for God and who did exploits for God. I want you to notice these men. They are given to us and called in the Hebrew, Geboah. Actually, it means powerful. They were powerful in the sense that they were in the will of God and that they were doing God's will. They are called over in First Chronicles, the 11th chapter there, they are called chief of the mighty men, which would indicate that this was just the, those in the uh, upper echelon. These were the brass, if you please. These were the ones that were in the Pentagon. Only they're a little different, than I think, than some of them in the Pentagon because these men had more than just an office and more than just a desk that they sat back of. They did things for God, if you please. And they are called, in another place, one of the three mighties. They're called God's Gibor, God's mighties. And then these three are called, in the chronicle passage, these things did these three mightiest. These are the three that stand at the head of the list. Now, I want you to notice the, these men, where they came from, because if we're going to know who they are, we have to know how they, in the world they got lined up with David. And if you should turn back to 1 Samuel, in the 22nd chapter, and the second verse, you'd read language like this. This was now when David was first starting out, when he was first anointed, driven out by Saul. And we read, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Now, these men are the men that came to David during the days of his rejection. In that interval, from the time the anointing oil was put upon him until he assumed the throne, and in that period Saul hunted him. And he was disciplined and trained of God out yonder in the dens and caves of the earth. And then we are told here that men began to drift in and come to him. Men, three types of men, if you please. Those that were in distress, those that were in debt, and those that were discontented. These are the three classes of men that came into David at this time. And we find here, we're told that there were 400 at the very beginning. Then we're told in 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the 13th verse, then David and his men, which were about 600. You see here in just a brief period of time, 200 more men had joined him. And I have no notion how many men were following David, but it was a young army by the time he came to the throne. Now, these are the men that came to him. They were, first of all, those that were in distress. And that means they were persecuted. That means they were oppressed by Saul. Saul was in power. David was rejected and out yonder in the cave. And uh, this man, Saul, is he persecuted men. They were in distress because of it. And they wanted deliverance. They wanted relief. And they heard of David. And they went out to David. And many a man came into the camp of David. And he came in in desperation. And he said, I have been hounded like you've been hounded. I have been hated as you've been hated. And I've come to join up with you. What a picture, my beloved. What a picture that is today of the Lord Jesus Christ 
for these are the days of his rejection. He's hunted and hounded in this earth. He says, if the world hate you, you will know that it hated me first. And you and I are living in a day when he's hated in the world. And if you are really on his side, you will never be voted the most popular person in your community. And I do not mean that you'll become objectionable or become unlovely. I think you'd become the opposite if you belong to him. But you would become that way because he today is not loved by this world. And we are living in the days of his rejection. And men and women today who are in distress, men and women today that feel a burden upon them, that they are sinners and they need a deliverance, they go to him today and enlist under his banner. Multitudes have done it. I remember reading just the other night the statement of John Bunyan. John Bunyan says that when I came to Christ, I did not come just as a sinner. He says that there was bowing in upon me the conviction that I was a sinner from the head of my the crown of my head to the sole of my foot, that I was sick with sin, that I was like a putrid running solar in God's sight. And in my desperation, I went to Christ and come to him. That's what we need today are those that are in distress. Those that see they're undone. Those that see there's no help or hope within them are among men today, and they're willing to step out and come in under the banner of Jesus Christ. For we are living in the days of his rejection. It was Krumacher years ago who said, that, speaking of David, he's a remarkable type of the divine prince. You see, <clears throat> David had several opportunities to destroy Saul. He did not take them. He said he's God's anointed, and God will have to take care of him. I will not. May I say that Christ is rejected today, but there's something else that's true. Satan is the prince of this world. I wish Christians believed that more. Satan today is the prince of this world. He's the one going up and down today like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He had the audacity to say to Jesus Christ, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world if you'll worship me. And my brother, if he didn't have the kingdom, our Lord would have called his hand. He had them. He is a usurper here today, and may I add this? God could put him out in a moment's time, but he's permitted to continue by the permissive will of God, and so he goes up and down. And he's the one today that causes our problems and our difficulties in the world. And you will have to leave his bailiwick you will have to get out from and under his rulership, but you will have to turn to Christ if you want to get rid of your distress. The Lord Jesus alone can relieve men of their distress. We're told that I think it's 15 million tranquilizer pills are being sold a year. They'll help you, my friend, but they won't get rid of your distress. Only Jesus Christ can give you relief from your distress today. There's another group that came to David, those that were in debt. You see, God attempted to protect his people from, from debt because in that day a man in debt was actually in a terrible predicament. And over in Exodus, the 22nd chapter, the 25th verse, you find this law. If thou lend money to any of my people that's poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. That is, 
no interest was to be charged. God protected the poor, but apparently Saul did not enforce the Mosaic law. And you'll find out even later on, during the time of Elisha, over in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, the first verse, listen to this. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be his bondmen. In other words, the sons of this woman would be sold into slavery. And that was what was happening to men in that day. Saul was not enforcing the Mosaic law, and many men got in debt. And they were in danger of being sold into slavery. But before they had go into slavery, they ran off and joined up with David. May I say to you that you and I live in a world where we are told that we are in debt. Every person here is in debt. I do not mean what we owe the government. If right now the national debt is such that I think it's $1,539 is what you owe this morning. Every person on top side of the earth, uh, uh, top side of the earth in America today owes $1,539. It'd take that to get America out of debt. Why don't you pay? Let's get this thing settled. Well, most of us can't pay, my beloved. We're in debt. But I'm not talking about that kind of debt. I'm talking about a debt that sin has put us in under. And that is the prayer our Lord taught his disciples to pray. Forgive us our debts, because we're in debt. And it was Paul who said to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. You and I are a debtor to measure up to God's standard. And it's a debt we cannot pay. Paul says that we can't, uh, according to the flesh, we'd never measure up. In Romans 8, 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. If you, if you attempt to live by the flesh, you are so far in debt, you'll never be able to pay yourself out. But the hymn has it right. He paid the debt and set us free. The Lord Jesus Christ, when you and I were hopelessly and helplessly in debt, he went to the cross and paid the debt, and that's what forgiveness is today. Not far from New York in a cemetery alone, close guarding its grave, stands a simple headstone, and all the inscription is one word alone, forgiven. No sculptor's fine art hath embellished its form, but constantly there, through the calm and the storm, it beareth this word from a poor fallen worm, forgiven. It shows not the date of the silent one's birth, reveals not his frailties nor lies of his worth, but speaks out the tale from his few feet of earth, forgiven. The death is unmentioned, the name is untold, beneath lies the body corrupted and cold, Above rests his spirit at home in the fold, forgiven. And when from the heavens the Lord shall descend, this stranger shall rise unto glory ascend, well known and befriended to sing without end, forgiven. David never paid the debt of any of his mighty men. But the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid your debt. And can you say, today I'm forgiven? I am a forgiven sinner. He has forgiven me. That's the only way in the world you'll ever get the debt canceled. And then the third, those that were discontented came to him. It means those that were a bitter of soul. Those that were discontented with life, and all over the world today there's a restlessness. It's been growing in a mighty crescendo since World War II. It's broken out now in the Near East. 
It breaks out in the Far East, and every now and then it even breaks out in South America. It will break out in America because there is a re restlessness in the world. A great many people today, because of the corruption and injustice of the world, are seeking for a change. And I personally believe that the injustice of this world and the corruption of this world will either make you a Christian or a communist. So go one way or the other, my friend. Discontented. Are you discontented this morning? Many a man, as he saw the injustice of Saul's reign, as he saw the way the things were going, and he attempted to make an honest living, he dropped his tools one day, and he left it all, and he went out and joined up with David. Many a man today... discontented with this world, knows that you can't find anything that satisfies in communism or any, any of the ideologies of this world. A man said to me the other day who had been a communist, he says, McGee, I've tasted them all, and they won't satisfy you. It was not until I came to Christ. My friend today, he is saved, and he is sending out the invitation he is gathering a group of mighty men around him during these days of his rejection. And personally, I think the greatest days in the life of David were those days when he was gathering mighty men around him. Oh, if we could only sense it. So many of us that are fundamental say, oh, if the Lord would come. And believe me, brother, I wish it. But when we get up yonder and look back down here, we are going to find these were the greatest days to live. We're going to look back, and I'm afraid many of us will have regrets, and we'll say, oh, if I could only go back and live my life over again, I'd live for God. He's gathering out those today. I talked to a young man the other day. The look in his eyes, discontented. I loved him. He talked and he said, I don't want to do this in life, and I don't want to do that in life. I want to give my life to God. <laughs> Discontented with everything down here, and he wants to live for God. Oh, if we had more like that. Those are the ones that will come to him. Those are the ones who came to David. Those are his mighty men. Now, what did they do? Well, they were men of unquestioned loyalty to David, men of undying courage, men of unfeigned love. Every one of them loved David personally. Everyone was a man of indefatigable zeal. Oh, how he would go out, all out for David. Every one of these men did exploits for God. Now, here is the story of these three. They came to David when he was in the cave of Adullam while he was rejected. And actually, David was in a bad spot at this particular time because not only was Saul hunting for him, but the Philistines had made a flank movement, had bypassed him, and had come into Bethlehem and had taken Bethlehem. It was harvest season. It was hot and dusty. And David, as he stood there that day in the cave of Adullam, he's thirsty. Huh. And he just, this is all he did. Listen to him. Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. You see, Bethlehem was his hometown. And he's thirsty, and he just says, Oh, I... If I just had a drink out of that well. Unfortunately, most of our young people today know nothing about this. They get their water out of a spigot, and uh, it all tastes the same, and that's bad. But uh, some of us were raised back in the country. I remember of going back to the little town I lived in as a boy. I'm sorry I took my wife because she's never ceased kidding me about that place. It's not very big, really. 
Not over a hundred people live there today. And when I went up to the place my dad had built in a well that he had digged, and there was still the old windmill there, and it still made the noise. I can at night still hear that old windmill as it was pumping up the water. And I went out to ask the people if I could go out and get a drink. And I went out and put my mouth in under the spigot that was coming right up out of the well. It's Jip water, West Texas, Jip water. Did you ever drink Jip water? I was raised on it, and honestly, I never tasted a chocolate malted milk that was as good as that. Oh, it was delicious. That Jip water, <laughs> it took me back to my boyhood, and right now I'm thirsty, and may I say to you, I wish I had a, I wish I had a big jug of that water this morning. Water from the well in Ira, Texas. You never heard of the place. And David says, David says, Oh, if somebody would only bring me a drink of water from the well in Bethlehem. He was thirsty. Now, will you notice this? David did not give a command. David could have, but he never called any soldier before him and said, Listen. Listen, your order of the day is that you're to get through and get me water from the well of Bethlehem. David wouldn't dare do that. David just expressed it as a wish of his heart. He says, oh, that if I could only get water from the well. Wasn't a command. But you know that David's soldiers so loved him and were so loyal to him that they treated his wishes as if they were commands. Those three, they heard him. One said the other. Said, you hear what he said? He wants a drink from the, from the well at Bethlehem. And one the other one said, well, you know, the Philistines are as thick as hops over that. And the other one says, yes, but says David wants the water. And all three started out. And my friend, they got the water. They went after it. And they brought it back to David, almost a superhuman task that they performed. May I say to you that the Lord Jesus, when he was down here upon this earth, you remember, he expressed a wish. He said to the woman at the well, give me the drink. I do not know, but it's, the record doesn't say she ever gave him a drink. He a little later says to his disciples, I have meat to, drink, uh, to eat that ye know not of, and I'm sure that he didn't get a drink either. He didn't get a drink when he asked for it. And yonder on the cross, he says, I thirst. And they gave him vinegar to drink. And listen, my friend, we think that was bad, but we treat the commands of Christ today as if they were just wishes and his whims. David's man treated his wishes as if they were commands. We treat the commands of Christ as if they're just wishes. Lord, I'll, you say to take the gospel to the end of the earth, well... If we get around to it, we'll do it for you, and I hope you'll appreciate what we're doing right now. The three mighty men broke through the line of the Philistines. And will you listen to this? And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines, drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Now... That's the strangest thing of all. It's the disposition that David made of the water. You know what, is, what he did here? He did not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. These three men brought back the water, and they said to David, here it is. I think every one of them was bloody. They had to fight to get through the lines and get that water and get back. And David saw what they'd done. My, how he was moved. He said, man, I couldn't stand here and drink this water. It'd be just like drinking your blood. That, that water represents your life, the life that you were willing to lay down for me. 
But David recognized the bravery of these men. He presented, I think, each one of them with a croque de guerre at that time and the Congressional Medal. And he said, I, I can't take it. I offer it as a libation unto God. I pour it out as a drink offering to God. Again, may I say to you, oh, what a lesson is there. The 22nd Psalm says that the Lord Jesus Christ, yonder on the cross, said certain things you will not find in the Gospels. And one of the things he said was, I'm poured out like water. He was a drink offering. He's the mighty man of God. He's called the mighty God by Isaiah. He came over the battlements of heaven into Satan's territory. He poured out his life like water upon the cross in order that there might be water from heaven for the souls of men and women that are thirsty. And now he says, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Oh, everyone that thirsteth. The invitation is to everyone, but it's limited to those that are thirsty. Are you thirsty? Are you discontented? Are you feeling debt to God? Oh, today, friend, go to him. Go to him. He has the water of life. It was toward the end of this civil war when Grant and Lee were locked in deadly mortal combat at Richmond all during the day. Both sides had gone back and forth over the battlefield in late afternoon. Out on the battlefield lay boys in blue and gray dying. A young Confederate lieutenant went to his captain and said, you hear those men out yonder that are wounded? And up was coming the cry, water, water, water. That young lieutenant says, I'm going to take them water. The captain says, it'll mean death. It's a foolish thing to do. Well, he says, I don't care. I'm going to take them water. He went around and he gathered up the canteens of the man and poured into his canteen the water that they had left till he, his was filled and he crawled out over the battlements out yonder into that no man's land and he went from one soldier to another those that were crying out still alive water 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 out over the battlement of heaven has come the son of god and he brought a canteen of water, his own life's blood that he shed upon the cross. And today, those that are thirsty can have a drink. You'll have to be thirsty. David's mighty men were inspired to do these heroic deeds because of what David had done in slaying the giant. Paul says in Philippians 2.17, something that you don't get in our translation. I'm reading from this amplified New Testament. But listen how Philippians 2.17 reads. Even if my life blood must be poured out as a libation on the sacrificial offering of your faith to God, still I'm glad to do it and congratulate you all on your share in it. Paul says, I want my life to be taken like a drink offering and taken and poured on the offering of Christ. That's the way the drink offering was used. It was put on a burnt offering. And the drink offering was poured on it, and it just went up in steam, of course. Paul says, I want my life to be spent just like that for Christ. Nothing for me but my life to be put on the sacrifice of Christ. That's the kind of man God needs today and God wants. Paul wanted his life to be like that, and I believe it was. Dwight L. Moody, as a boy, sat in the balcony, heard an unknown preacher by the name of Henry Varley make this statement. 
The world has yet to see what God can do with a man that's fully yielded to him. Dwight L. Moody, a young boy sitting there, says, By the grace of God, I'll be that man. When Dwight L. Moody was dying, he says, The world has yet to see what God can do with a man that's fully yielded to him. For my money, Dwight L. Moody was that man. My friend today, this low level on which Christians are living is not pleasing to God. God today is calling you to a high play. But if you come to him, you'll have to first come to Christ in your distress. A lost sinner. You'll have to come recognizing you owe God a debt. You'll have to come discontented with this world. If you are enjoying drinking at the cisterns of Los Angeles, you'll never come to him. But if you're discontented, come to him. And then the next thing, you'll have to do what David's mighty men did. Those mighty men loved David. That great big fisherman, Simon Peter says, whom having not seen, ye love. And his question to Simon Peter is his question to you, lovest thou me? Oh, to be in love with Jesus Christ today. Have you experienced the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ? who willingly gave his life so that you may have eternal life and fellowship with the Father? If you'd like to know more about God's gift of salvation for your life, then we'd love to send you some helpful information. All you need to do is call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can do it any time. Leave a voicemail request and request the salvation packet. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station, and we'll make sure that information gets to you. Today's sermon was Water from the Well of Bethlehem, and it's available for purchase on an individual cassette tape, CD, or as part of a seven-cassette album called David, A Man After God's Own Heart. This tape album is also available in a hardback book format by the same title. For ordering information, contact one of our service operators at 1-800-65-BIBLE, Monday through Thursday, from 6 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. This week, we'll be wrapping up Dr. McGee's study in 2 Samuel and proceeding through the historical books of First and Second Kings. So be sure to join us on the Through the Bible radio program this week, heard every Monday through Friday on this station. To be added to our mailing list for notes and outlines, you may contact us anytime when you call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Use our Internet order form or download them from our website at ttb.org. And, of course, you can always write to Sunday Sermon in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. For those in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace. Jesus, This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.